morning, everyone. Welcome to the morning show. We're coming to you this morning on WJOP LP New Report at FM 96.3 on Channel 9 and on YouTube at ncmhub.org. I'm your host, Mary Jacobson, and I am just delighted to welcome novelist Erica Forensic here this morning. She is the author of Girl in Ice, which was named a 2022 New York Times Editor's Choice and an LA Times Best Crime Novel of Winter 2022, among many other honors that it received and, and well-deserved. Um, Girl in Ice has been described by the New York Times as hauntingly beautiful, and I promise you it is. The Wall Street Journal called it a psychological suspense novel, a linguistic thriller, and a scientific puzzle, puzzle and, I, and it is. <laughs> it's set in the Arctic Circle, and the plot follows Val, a brilliant linguist who's struggling to understand the apparent suicide of her twin brother. That pursuit leads her to venture hundreds of miles north to the Arctic Circle to try to find a way to communicate with a young girl, Sigrid, who has been thawed alive from the ice after 700 years. It's a novel that transcends genres and it's a complete page turner. I just loved it. So Erica, first of all, thanks for writing the book. Welcome and thanks for taking time to visit the morning show. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Mary. This is just a delight. Well, it's a delight to have you here and to get to talk to you about this book, which I just thoroughly love. Well, I, I was hoping that we could start, if you could talk to us about what inspired you with the intriguing premise that a child frozen some hundred years ago could be thawed successfully and restored to life. Well, the um, the original, the, 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 the spark of the idea came uh, in the winter of 20, 2018. I was walking behind my home. I'm lucky enough to have some conservation back there. And um, it was, it was you know, five degrees below zero. <laughs> it was so cold. And I saw along the edge of this pond, uh, these frozen painted juvenile turtles. They were just mid-stroke, you know, frozen. And I thought, and I was like, oh my God. They don't look alive, but they don't look dead either. Mm -hmm. So I ran home and, of course, Googled it. And it turns out that there are creatures that um, can do this. Uh, certain turtles, certain beetles, um, even certain microscopic creatures. There's actually a 0.05 millimeter creature called a tardigrade or water bear. It's oh, yes. adorable. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they these are, guys. They are tiny, tiny, tiny and tiny, adorable. Tiny. They're adorable <laughs> when you blow them up. And and um, so those guys, you can freeze those guys to 360 degrees below zero. You can shoot them into space <laughs> and you thaw them out and they're just fine. Right. So uh, anyway, so back to and and but most of these creatures, you know, they have a um, something we don't have which is called a cryoprotein. And you know, think about ice, think about water. When it turns to ice, of course, it becomes jagged. And so yeah. we are mostly water. If we were to freeze, our cells would be destroyed by by by, our, by the you know jagged nature of frozen water. So, um, of course, we're working on freezing ourselves. But in my case, <laughs> I keep, I, it's not, I don't think it's worked yet. But um, so I ran home and I thought, well, what, what would it be like if a young girl were fl uh, frozen in, in a glacier? And for some reason, she thought out alive. And so my, yeah. you know, my task then was to say, OK, who is this kid? What happened to her? What is her story? Um, and so from there, I just worked back and back and back. And I thought, well, I needed a linguist. I needed someone to try to understand her language. And then I had to build a mystery around it. And uh, so. You know, a lot of times um, people ask me, oh, so where are you going next to write your story? But I just want to, you know, say that um, the story comes first for me. Mm -hmm. It's never a location because, you know, polar bears get you only so far, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or, or, you know, in, in my case with Into the Jungle, snakes and so on. You need, you know, you, you need the human, you need a human story. Yeah. So that um, was my task. And so I worked back from that. Um Normally, I spend oops, about six months on an outline. Um, I get a first draft written. I do everything I can, you know, uh, online and in books and so on. And then I go to the location to, yeah. you know, really understand it. Well, that's so. an intriguing process and, and, and proof that inspiration can find you anywhere, even in a pond in the yes. woods. <laughs> yes. Yes. It certainly Absolutely. served you well. <laughs> and us readers, too, for Girl in Ice. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that, um, you know, part of your um, uh, process for writing Girl in Ice was also traveling to Greenland. 
Um, <laughs> and, and I was hoping that you would tell us a little bit about your observations of that Arctic setting, because it's a real presence in the book. It's like the, the weather, the environment is like a spectral presence in the background, right. the sounds right. of ice breaking, the danger of crevices. Um, and so uh, the changes in the light as well. Um, yeah. and, uh, what's happening to glaciers. So I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about, um, what it was like for you to travel the trip? to New Zealand. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, um, again, I do believe if it's possible to go to a place because if just for example, you know, I can describe New York city to you and I can talk about the noises and the smells and the, you know, everything, but, you know, think about the difference between learning of that and going and standing in Times Square. And just standing there and like listening. Yeah. So um, I think that uh, I read all about Greenland. I went there, um, you know, and again, you, you read about, oh, it's, you know, so isolated. There's no one, there's nothing. But when you get there and you actually stand there and there is nothing man-made for thousands of miles, um, that is a feeling that is, I found, terrifying and absolutely beautiful and life-changing and I think that in fact the main character Val um, the concept of the enormity uh, is something in the book where Val well, Val is actually trying to deal with grief grief is a is a theme in the book we'll talk about that but um, she feels the enormity not only of her internal process but the enormity of the world and then just for me it was uh, I mean <laughs> To go out on a kayak into the, we went to this place called the um, uh, Iceberg Graveyard in our oh. kayaks. And, um, you know, here we were in these tiny, tiny, tiny little kayaks. And there's this massive, massive, massive iceberg. I'm talking, you know, 20 stories high or 30 blocks long carved in these bizarre shapes that only wind and rain and 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 sea waves can can create and um anyway so i was there and we were there were only six of us and um with a guide and i said well what if one of these breaks you know uh what do we do and he said well he kind of wanted to say well it's kind of over if they do yeah i bet <laughs> but instead he said well what you do if you hear something can we were hearing all the time very distant explosions you know, things were happening all the time, all night long, too. Uh, but anyway, so he said, if you hear one, uh, just turn your kayak toward the sound because the wave, the massive wave that will be generated will wash over you and not flip you over. So we all shut the hell up and we're like, OK. <laughs> so some things is better not to know. <laughs> yeah, well, no, it was actually really good to know that. But I mean, we didn't um, go too close to them, but just yeah. just for safety reasons. But uh it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was incredible. We, we, we camped on the ice cap mm -hmm. for a night or two. We were, uh, had these like crappy little electric fences that were supposed to keep out polar bears. I'm like, no way. I mean, no <laughs> way. If I were a polar bear, I'd be like, what? You know, <laughs> but, um, we saw one, but that, was on, a, on another day but um it was it was a fantastic journey just to just to go there and very, I feel very privileged to go there it's one of the few places in the world that has a true sense of mystery I think left and I think the human mind and soul needs that uh yeah. sense of mystery and wonder you know uh which we can find every day I found it in my backyard with the frozen turtles you don't have to go to Antarctica or Greenland just let me say but um so well it, it's one of the things that i enjoyed about girl and ice because you convey the strangeness to somebody who comes from a much more urban environment in a very different climate um mm -hmm. just what you described the enormity and just the the strangeness to us of yeah. the environment and how that has an impact on opening your mind the first time i traveled to the desert southwest at the sonoran mm -hmm. desert museum i remember the moment i remember looking out at the extremely different color palette um, and the surprise of learning how many life forms could survive there that I just was unaware of and thinking. And you were just shocked to learn that there were so many, actually. Yes. And the, yeah. I had the distinct feeling that if I stayed there for any length of time, it would change me. 
Um, yeah. And that's the sense I get from what you describe about the mm -hmm. Arctic Circle. And that sense of wonder and mystery, though, and, and the di and different environments and how they land on our, our hearts and minds mm -hmm. makes me want to shift then to the um, topic of linguistics in your book. Because yeah. the main character, Val, is a, is a professor of, of fairly esoteric subjects in linguistics, which enables you then uh, to prevent fascinating insights into exactly how environments do shape the concepts and thereby the words that we need. And you describe a culture that has, for example, many, many different words characterizing different types of ice. Uh, which, yes. You know, we don't have, perhaps mercifully so. Um, and, and so I was hoping that you could tell us about, um, in your study of these um, uh, different languages, what are some of the words or concepts you discovered these other cultures had that delighted you the most or have stayed with you? Well, I, it was, it's, it's an interesting question because I, I had to, I was trying to, well, there was, there's the, there's the problem of, you know, you have this girl who thawed from the ice 700 years ago and I was, I was make, and she's, she wakes up. She's doesn't recognize where she is. She's terrified. She's, can you imagine waking up in a, uh, and you don't know, you've never seen a house before or a dwelling. You don't recognize who's looking at you. Uh, anyway, so she's too terrified to speak. So I had to actually make up this, this ancient language of hers. And I thought, well, what would it be? Uh, what would it sound like? And um, so I studied uh, Nordic languages, Norwegian, um, Danish, I even listened to Viking languages. When I say studied, I, I did as much as I needed to to come up with sort of the the morphemes and the and the and the tonality of a, a, her new language. Um, that was that part of it. Um, but just studying, just talking to, I inter interviewed linguists for this, and I asked them, you know, a girl thoughts from the ice. She doesn't speak. How would you communicate with her? Yeah. So. They said, well, uh, if there's no cultural artifacts lying around, uh, you, we'd almost be like, you know, learning with a baby. You know, you start with objects and maybe you learn about numbers from, you know, one marble or many marbles and so on. So that was that was that journey. It's almost like a Helen Keller type of journey with this girl. So uh, I had a lot of fun with that uh, story. But in terms of, you know, language, uh, I was just fascinated to learn that there are words that, you know, we we, we create the words that we need to live in our world, yeah. to live in our society. Um, there's a word in Japanese, shibui, which refers to the beauty of aging, which mm. lo and behold, we don't have that in our culture yeah. because culturally we don't value aging uh, the way that culture does. There's a Tibetan word, bardo, which refers to that liminal space between life and death we don't generally believe that exists and then i had fun with words like katzenjammer katzenjammer is a german word for a monumentally severe hangover which i think should exist getting <laughs> <laughs> i love it katzenjammer um but in greenlandic you know well there is a language like oh maybe i'll learn a few words right i mean this is an absolutely <laughs> foreign language foreign language um these words or word sets or morphemes or units of meaning are something like you know the longest one is over like 40 letters long mm. and it means the longest one i found was uh let's see it's it, it's it means it's think of 40 letters crammed together it means i saw the caribou but the caribou saw me and it ran away so i couldn't kill it <laughs> That's like this unit of meaning, but um, you talk about so some Gre some Greenlandic words, which I'm not going to try to pronounce. There's a word for that feeling of being so part of nature that you are one with it, that there is that you are truly one with it. We don't have a word like that. Uh, this joy, that joy and feeling and feeling part of nature. We of course have these feelings. Yeah. But as far as I know, we don't have a word for it. Yeah. Um, they're right. I mean, their word for climate change, a Greenlandic word for climate change is means translates to a friend acting strangely. Which is just so evocative. Right. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, so for 
first of all, think about the word friend. We don't think of nature as friend. We we talk about, you know, our, uh, bomb cyclones. When we have a snowstorm, it's very antagonistic. Yeah. Um, we talk about bad weather, good weather. I think it's very insidious the way we talk about weather. It further separates us from mm -hmm. the natural world, which is to our detriment. Anyway, I could go on about that. <laughs> um, there's another word, another word um, that translates into the great necessity, and mm -hmm. that is a is means something in our culture too. We do anything to stay alive. We don't really talk about it or have a word for it, but. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Greenland is a sub hunting and fishing subsistence culture, which you can read about in a history book. But unless you've spent a month there watching people hunting for their dinner, and 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 that's it, basically, mm -hmm. except for maybe a, there's a little town store with a wormy apple for five dollars, you know, and some and some canned dog food for five dollars, which you know they don't <laughs> buy, they they hunt. Um, yeah. Then it's it's very hard to to understand this culture, but um, so talk, so words for snow and ice. There are several dozen words for snow, mm -hmm. but there are over 170 words for ice. Yeah. Why is that? Why would you need that? So you need, it's a life and death situation. You go out on the ice and for example, there's a, there's a word for a new ice when it's just leathery and just forming and so on. Um, there's a word for, there's several words actually, for really old ice. Mm. So I I said so hard, you can't even cut it to, you know, make things or use things, uh, use it to to build uh, buildings or igloos or self shelter. Um, there's a word for ice that is, that will support a man or a hunter, but not a polar bear. Okay. And and it has, and it will, it will allow a seal to make a breathing hole. Now that, now isn't that perfect ice? Well, that's perfect that's, ice if you're a hunter, right? Absolutely. You know, and I don't want to say, I don't want to say 500 words to you, right? The word, the, you know, I want to say it's blah blah, whatever that word is. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> we find shortcuts to express ourselves because. So um, yeah, so just just how language we re, you know reveals culture. But Greenland, I mean, let me, can I talk quickly about Greenland as a yeah, place? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's just like, uh, it's just amazing. It is a third, it's the most, it's the biggest island in the world. It's a third the size of Canada. Think about that. It's a land mass with 56,000 people, which is one tenth the population of yeah. Wyoming. Yeah. And they're uh, mostly, they're in the biggest, really only city is Nuke, and there are about 20,000 people there. That's on the, um, southwest coast, but the rest are tiny little settlements on the coast. And it's about 1,500 miles east to west, 700 miles north to south. I might have that backwards, but it's a 6,000 square mile ice pack. And if it were to melt, God forbid, the seas would rise 23 feet just from that melt um and so it's 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 a culture that is as recently as 1950 people lived in these buildings called sod huts mm. and a sod hut is so the growing season there really is no growing season but summer is like 50 days long it's going to all be obviously it's growing longer but um people would dig into the ground uh, when it was soft enough to do so and then they would build a roof over their heads with whale ribs peat mm. sod and rocks wow. and they would live in there 10 months a year four or five families at a time and the only way they saw light was through their windows quote unquote which were created from seal intestine hmm. uh, in which they could look out and I actually had the great opportunity to interview this mayor of this tiny little town called Tinit. And he was 70 years old, seven zero years old. And he was born in one of these. He was wow. born in one of these. And I interviewed him and I, he, he told me he left when he was seven, when his family, when they were starting to build, quote, real houses. I mean, and I'm talking extremely simple houses. Um, and I said, what was it like? Were you, were you excited? Were you, was it, what was it? 
must have been so strange. And he said, yeah, well, you know, we moved into the house, but actually they they built the house on top of the sod hut because they were so worried that it wasn't going to like work out. They could always like go back. Down there. Go back. <laughs> I know. And I said, so what, what do you love about it? And he's like, well, it's okay. He, he was so much less excited than I thought. And he said, I really miss how close we were. Uh, I miss the intimacy of, I mean, we, we, we hunted together. We, we sang, we told stories, we took care of each other. Now I said, yeah, but they're right across the street, you know, this little, and he's like, yeah, but it's not the same. It was, yeah. it was, we were like one creature and yeah, I, yeah. yeah. And I was like, but I never expected to hear that. Yeah. You know? That's, you know, everything you're saying, it's like same planet, but very, very, very different experiences <laughs> yes. of the planet, yes. depending upon the culture that you grew up in. And that's, as you've been saying, affected by the environment that you grew up in, and then the language and the concepts that that environment makes available to you. So fascinating, Erica. Well, you know, one of the things I also wanted to ask you about, um, we you mentioned climate change, but it's a big yeah. theme in your book. And one of the theme, one of the experiences that you have people um, uh, endangered by due to climate change in the book is a sudden kind of freezing winds um, yeah. that will just freeze people to death at the spot because they don't, right. they're not like wood frogs. <laughs> or right, any, right. Any they don't turtle. have that thing. And so I wondered, um, you know, what inspired you um, to 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 um, include these sudden freezing winds, and yeah. and and just, um, you know, if you could talk a little bit about the the theme of climate change and the impact you were hoping um, the things you have to say about melting glaciers and things like that might have on readers. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I don't know about you, but. Um... Actually, I know a little bit about you because you're very involved with nature and, and you have this, this great sensitivity. But um, the books, my, my first book, The River at Night, uh, had some mention of climate change thematically. Um, my second book, Into the Jungle, dealt with it more. Um, and now Girl and Ice, it's a, it's a huge, it's a huge theme in there. And let me also preface that. You know, I never write books to send a message because, yeah. if, you know, I've always been told in writing school, if you want to send a message, call Western Union, because <laughs> that's a different kind of right. communication. Right. right. It's so got to the, it's come through the story. <laughs> it's got to come through the story. So and, and I'm not even and not even sneakily through the story. It has to come through your heart. It has to come through the heart of the story. Um, but I, I've also found over these years of writing that and I've been writing for 40 years that you you have to reflect your heart you can't help it you can't you know spend years writing a book without being passionate and and passion comes from mysterious places but it's not so mysterious in some ways because it's from what we're experiencing from day to day yeah and we are experiencing this terrible thing so i think that i wanted to express through the story um, a concern with climate change, but it, and it is part of the story. Now, you talked about the winds. Um, there are really are winds called catabatic winds that are extremely strong and, and, you know, they can be deadly, not as deadly as they are in the book. One of the things I love to write about or hit, let's see, this level of writing uh, is this line between what's real and what's not real, what's really science and what's just mm, maybe a little bit farther than that. Um, for example, this this frozen girl. Um, but another example is I take catabatic winds and in the in the in the story itself, um, catabatic winds are increasing all over the world and they're freezing people to death and we can't do anything about it. And it turns out, a little bit of spoiler here, that this girl 700 years ago, this was happening during the Little Ice Age, which was happening then, and her community, small community, was being hit by these winds, but they had figured out a way to survive. And it was a secret, and we won't go into it, uh, but I wanted to bring it into the present, and I wanted to say, this is a current concern, this is the current terror that's going on. But again, catabatic winds in, in, in Greenland, they're happening now. They're called pitteracks. And 
they 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 happen in Greenland because of the great temperature difference between the glacier and mm. uh you know and barometric pre pressure differences so they come charging off the glacier yeah charging off the glacier and they did um they kill some people in a small town in like 1965 and i was like you know um you know why not use that and like have it part of this girl's mystery this sigrid's mystery how did how did her community survive and why did she survive yeah versus others in the community and that reflects what we're doing now yeah. you know the yeah. fact that right the fact that yeah. probably the one percenters or whatever or certain people are going to survive this and others are going to be horribly horribly impacted not that we're all gonna we're all gonna be impacted but so yeah. i wanted to have that little microcosm happening hundreds of years ago and have it sort of reflect and and, and charge the story um well well, it's it's a fascinating part of the story, and 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 not too much of a spoiler, but the, we did say it is a murder mystery. <laughs> yes, it is a murder. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. And this yeah. part becomes part of the. This part is integral too. That so just 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 you have yes. to read the book to find out how. <laughs> but anyway, it's right. just fascinating, Erica. And again, to reiterate, there's just so much in the book. And one of the things in the book that I did want to get to is, um, you know, grief. Um, because uh, main character Val is is driven by grief, the loss of her twin um, to maybe suicide, maybe not. And again, you'll have to read the book to find out that part of the mystery. Mm -hmm. But she has a very complicated relationship with her father. Um, and um, so I was curious to ask you, many of Val's main character decisions are driven by the grief that she's experiencing, even her decision to go to the Arctic, which she's very wary of. Um, uh, and I was curious to find out what made you decide to highlight grief as a theme uh, in the book. Well, I think it's one of the, it's like love. It's this massive human emotion. And it's something that, uh, is so universal, uh, yet it is so specific. We each experience grief in different ways at different times. And I would I would wager that we're every one of us is grieving something all the time yeah. at some level. Maybe you, you know, you lost your pet, or maybe you didn't get a contract that you need for work, or maybe you found an age spot and you're like holy crap i'm getting older and i you know and i just we're all processing this this i think grief is um it just it humanizes us and makes us humble uh and and mm -hmm. you know i could talk about that but i think in the book i needed a driver and i and i also i'm interested in how what grief makes us do i think it's important that we recognize grief in each other and it and and how again it does unite us and also um our different reactions i mean wyatt for example wyatt is the the main scientist in this place and we learn later that he's dying um and and he so he's grieving his own uh, oncoming death how is he doing that what is what is he doing to you know process that and depending on your, his personnel and he is what is he doing well he's trying to take this girl and make her and profit from her mm -hmm. profit from her ability to survive the ice winds that is what's making he wants a legacy okay so that's driving him yeah. what does val do well she has a very she's she's kind of she's not agoraphobic but she's she's pretty phobic um she's barely left town in, in her whole life and here in order to find out what happened to her brother, she has to go to Greenland. Mm -hmm. And so that's a massive test for her. And so grief, in her case, grief motivates her to, to discover what happened. Um, and so I think that if we, if we are always keep in mind that the grief you know, unites us in these ways, we'll be more compassionate with each other and more understanding. You never know what, the cashier in the supermarket is going through that day or um or just just anything so i think that um i, I just really liked that as a motivator and the different characters yeah are are are, are 
are mourning the loss of, of people. And, and, and um, for example, there's a woman, Jean. Jean is sort of the grunt in the, um, in the climate research lab. And she's gone to Greenland. She lost her family in a car crash. And she just doesn't want to be anywhere around people anymore. Where yeah. is the farthest place I can go to be away? And then ironically, she can't get away from her grief process. Yeah. which manifests itself in unhealthy relationships, unhealthy relationships and, you know, bad actions. <laughs> I yeah. say. You have to read the book, but, you know, so, I mean, it's just, I, I, um, it's just a great, it's a great story mover really. Yeah. Grief is. Well, and, 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 and I like the way you describe grief as right up there with love uh, as a fundamental yeah. motivator. And of course they're linked. Um, of course. Uh, together. Yes. And, and uh, I like the way you uh, have been describing the uh, characters and people we meet in life. Sometimes the key to understanding somebody is looking for the losses and the grief um, right. that they're experiencing. So that's very wise, Erica. <laughs> Thank oh, you. you know, I work on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think practice, I practice in the mirror before the show. <laughs> well, oh my God. I, I can be a wise ass. I can be a wise ass. <laughs> well, there's one final relationship I have to ask you about before we oh. finish for the day. And that is, of course, the relationship between Val and Sigrid. Um, because to, to me, Val and Sigrid's relationship, um, it's the book's heart and soul. And mm -hmm. and and the reader, this reader anyway, just falls in love um, with this little girl who, as you were describing earlier, she wakes up, nothing is familiar. Nobody that she knew when she was growing up is around. It's totally different. Mm -hmm. And yet she's a strong person. She is fierce in a lot of ways and smart in a lot of ways. And um, anyway, she's just totally an amazing and and and, and really <laughs> wonderful extremely memorable character i have a very vivid picture of, of what she oh, looks good. like in my, my head my job's done <laughs> <laughs> you and you, you yes you accomplish your goal my work is so, done <laughs> i just um i mean she's such a vivid character and and you've invested so much um complexity and love in that relationship that i have to ask you what that little girl meant to you um, and did you fall in love with her as you wrote with her? Um, you know, just tell us a little bit about, um, you know, Sigrid. Well, the great thing about being as a writer, you can make up anything you want. So you can <laughs> manifest love on the page. You can just, mm -hmm. you can just create something that, yeah, I absolutely love this girl. But I, I actually love all my characters, even the, you know, the antagonists, because you see the humanity in them. But with yeah. Sigrid, I mean, this little girl felt she was she had to communicate via drawings at first because she couldn't communicate. And she was so traumatized at first. She didn't even want to do that with Val because she didn't trust Val. So so Val's journey with her is one of. Um, you know, they're just like looking at each other like aliens from outer space. And and once the secret understands that unless she starts communicating, she will die. Yeah. Um, then she becomes. She reaches out to Val, but um, actually, lo I love secret because, you know, when, remember one of the you know, Greenlandic words uh for feeling inseparable from nature? I wanted her to see it's like a the embodiment of that yeah yeah she is the embod she mm -hmm. comes from a culture where unless you know 170 words for snow and unless you know exactly how to serve i mean this is a culture that to survive you have bone you have ice you have rock mm. what do you lit what do you live on what do you mm. how do you survive and you have skins you have caribou skins you know uh you have something like five items you survive. You try that. You learn that. Um, I think that I wanted her to almost, I hate not symbolize because that sort of takes away from the story, but she is this lost connection with nature that we, yeah. we know it's there. We can go walk in the woods. We're like, why do I feel better? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Every time I do this, yeah. that's not a fluke. No, that is, that is reality. And we, there's, there's so much more that we don't know than we know. We have no idea why. And I think one day we will mm -hmm. understand why chemically we feel so much mm -hmm. better, this connection. 
but it doesn't matter why right now what matters now is that we under is that we respect it and mm -hmm. take all the action necessary mm -hmm. to save ourselves which is you know so but for Val I wanted this you know, this girl is almost like her spirit you know it's mm -hmm. like her uh it's how she wants to be this mm -hmm. brave kid who is also very loving to her and yes. teaches her her language. Yeah. Um, so it changes. It changes now. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's an extraordinary relationship, and it must be clear to everybody by now as we've been talking, Girl and Ice is an extraordinary book, and it contains the universe. So thank you so <laughs> much, Erica, for writing it. I thoroughly enjoyed um, it. Thank um, you. And I and I look forward, uh, we should repeat that you have two other uh, prior um, novels. I do. Into yeah, a little the commercial here, a little commercial. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Into the Jungle. Mm -hmm. I spent a month in the Peruvian Amazon doing research for this book. It's about a young woman who moves in with, who follows a Bolivian man to the jungle and has to survive, giving you the total, like, tiny, you know. Mm -hmm. And then my debut, The River at Night, is about four friends who go whitewater rafting in northern Maine, lose the raft, and have to survive not only the wilderness, but a mother and son who have disappeared themselves for their own tragic reasons. I spent a month in the Aristook territory of Northern Maine interviewing some scary people who live off the ground. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe my husband hasn't served me divorce papers, but, you know, anyway. <laughs> and Erica, for people who wanted more information about you and your books, uh, would you give us the URL for your website, please? It's super easy if you know how to spell my name. It's That's Erica. why I asked you to I do that. I know, right? <laughs> it's Erica Forensic, Erica, E-R-I-C-A, Forensic, kind of like it sounds, F-E-R-E-N-C-I-K. Just, I'm all over the place. You won't be able to get away from me. You'll be supposed to think of me. <laughs> you know? But wherever, wherever books are sold. <laughs> Erica, thank you so much uh, <laughs> thank uh, you. For, the, for, the, for the book. Um, and also, thank you so much for taking time to visit the morning sure. show and share sure. with us uh, um, insights into the book and a wealth of information, cultural and scientific, that are embedded into the story um, in yep. Girl and Ice. <laughs> so thank you so much. It's just been thank such a joy you. to talk to you. And I look forward to your next work. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. You no, take everyone, care go now. for a walk today. Yes, absolutely. Go for it's what? Funny. Rain, snow? Just dress for it. <laughs> just be outside. No bad weather, just bad clothes. Okay. That, oh, that's right. I remember they right? said that when the Olympics were in Norway. <laughs> they, said they, say no such, they said there's no such thing as bad weather, just bad winter clothing. So <laughs> and you know, the thing, I used to live in Buffalo, and that's where I learned they're right about that. <laughs> I'm jealous. Oh, my God. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much, Erica. That's it for the morning show today, everybody. Uh, so please join us again next Thursday at 9 for the morning show. Till then, be well and go outside. Go outside. <laughs> Bye, Erica. Take Bye. care now. Bye-bye. <laughs>